This is the last fireside chat tonight, and I am very happy to introduce Keith Schacht and Doug Peltz from Mystery Science. Thank you. Woo! Thanks. Could you guys just start us off by introducing yourselves, please? I'll let you go first. Okay. I'm Doug uh, from Mystery Science, and I uh, taught elementary and middle school science for seven years before this guy convinced me to quit my job and uh, join a startup in San Francisco. Um, and I'm Keith Schacht. Um, Doug and I have been friends a long time, uh, 16, 17 years. We lose track. Uh, we, we met in college. And Doug went right into the classroom outside of school. I started a, a couple, uh, three startups, and sort of mm, s certain small, medium level of success, and then joined Facebook, and left Facebook to start Mystery Science and convinced Doug to come along with me. So just to kick things off, what is Mystery Science? Good question, Jeff. That, Thank that, you. that was a softball right there. Um, <laughs> They're all softballs. So mystery science from the teacher's perspective. Most elementary teachers in this country, and by you know kindergarten through fifth grade, um, about 95% of elementary schools in the country have zero um, elementary teachers on staff. I'm so sorry, science teachers on staff. And so elementary teachers. <laughs> <laughs> that would be weird, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they, uh, uh, so no science teachers on staff. Um, so the elementary teacher is expected to teach science, and it's a, the subject they struggle with the most. So mystery science is an interactive curriculum that they use now instead of their textbook to help them teach science. Um, we often describe it that it feels to them like a virtual science expert named Doug who co-teaches the class with them remotely. So it's a sort of pre-recorded choreographed experience. How many schools teach mystery science? It's always a fuzzy number to count. We have, on a weekly basis, we have active teachers now in more than 10% of schools. Um, wow. it, might, it might be a lot more than that now, I forget. That's amazing. Tell us the, you gave a little hint at it, but tell us the founding story of Mystery Science. It sounds like someone had to be convinced, sounds like there was an inspiration. Can you, can you sort of walk us through how it happened, how you got together, and how you actually you know, kicked off this crazy venture? Well, Keith, Keith, as he mentioned, we met in college, and um, he was always my tech engineering friend. So, you know, he would explain to me, like, I'd say, how does email work? Like, what happens when I, I, I would use what happens when you click like on Facebook, but we're old enough that there wasn't Facebook yet, so I'd, I'd be lying. But he would explain that to me. Yeah, and Doug was my nature friend, so he would be like, I'm taking you out of the computer lab, and we're going on a hike, and you're going to walk through the woods, and I'm going to show you cool stuff. And so we always had this fun back and forth. Um, and I knew, once I got to college, like, I, I had always loved science from the time I was a kid, and the only career path is, you know, you become a scientist. That's what everyone told you. Um, I never had it, like, it's so, it's so funny, so many of my friends who work in education cite, like, an influential teacher. I never had like a great science teacher. Uh, I like science in spite of it. I, th I figured that when I got to college, uh, science explanation would be so much better because now the scientists themselves would be teaching you. And it turns out they're even worse at explaining things. So I got really interested in the problem of explaining science. And I figured out while I was in college that I wanted to become a teacher and write my own curriculum. Keith went on a little bit of a different path, but it was around the time that he had kids that he started um, taking an interest in my career. And we always had this shared interest of explaining science and technology to other people. And so I, I, right out of school, I did the same thing. I did it at an advanced level, helping R&D engineers learn about new materials and manufacturing processes and electronic components and things like that. And so Doug and I would have this fun exchange every year. We'd get together, often over Thanksgiving, and, and teach each other things. And as he mentioned, I had kids. I was at Facebook. I was visiting, uh, my wife and I were visiting Doug and his wife over Thanksgiving. And you, as soon as you have kids, you start thinking about, like, where am I going to send them? And what, what, how am I going to be responsible for this other human being's life for the next, whatever, 12, 16, 18 years? And I saw Doug teach in the classroom. And I, I was very interested in education. My wife was an educator as well. And seeing Doug teach in the classroom, I thought, OK, my kid is going to learn science from Doug. Like, check. All right. I don't want to move down to Orange County, but that's somehow a piece of the equation. And that's a series of conversations started then of like, okay, we should, we have this shared passion, we should really work on this, and I'll skip a few steps in the story, but you know, our, the, the passion, the, the sort of shared passion we had was 
that there's this fascinating body of knowledge in the world about um, you know, body of knowledge about how the world works. I mean, this is what science and te technology is. It's what makes our modern lives possible. And we all learn about it, kind of, in school. We take science class, but it's very often one of the most boring classes that you take. Like it is labeling the part, the layers of the earth, the crust, the mantle, there's a molten core in the middle. You guys remember doing that? And you label the parts of a cell, there's the mitochondria, there's a, what color do you color those? You know, they're always like, or, or, you know. Purple. I, yeah, it, and, and that's what science class has become. It's this exercise in vocabulary memorization, but it wasn't that for us. And so that was the spark of the idea was like, there is this huge disconnect here between how fascinating this content is and how, how terrible it's being presented. We should do something about that. Now, it was not obvious that we were gonna be in schools and create a curriculum and all that stuff, but that was enough that Doug somehow convinced his wife to leave his job and move up here somehow, but he handled that part. So when you started, you didn't even know who your customer was. You didn't know you were gonna sell to schools. You didn't know what you were gonna sell. You just said, we're going to find a better way to teach science. Yes, yes, and I mean, we knew our customer was children. So, you, you know, I, now I think of us not as an education company, but as a learning company. Like we almost fought kicking and screaming into schools. Uh, you know, we, we knew we wanted to reach children and parents we assumed were our gatekeeper to children. You can't get a six-year-old to sign up for your website and start using something. So we're thinking about children five to 10 years old and we prototyped a whole series of products initially for parents and then some pa friends of ours were homeschooling and then and one of them happened to be for elementary teachers. But it was with much res reservation that we started thinking about schools. So uh, Ben Horowitz wrote this book, book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things and it, it sounds like, you know, if, if you just step back a second, like, we're gonna reinvent science curriculum for kids. And, and we're going to make a business out of that. That sound, did you know how stupid and hard that was going to be? <laughs> Halfway. Uh, you know, we, we managed to convince some people to give us money early on that, you know, in spite of it being stupid and hard. Um, yes. I mean, I think we had, partly I had done this a few times before. So I expected, you know, I said to Doug, I'm like, well, the last three times I started something, it took me six to eight months to go from from vague sentence on a napkin to like you know meaningful business it took us more like 18 months so it was harder than we thought but i was i told doug it'll take six months don't worry <laughs> i remember After that. six months you were you what did you say to yourself when you were still 12 months away from maybe six out? more <laughs> i mean that was i can those so then in the first year uh, we probably went through depending on how you count it we probably went through five or six different like products, one of them we spent I don't almost six months on, and, and we thought that was the one. Yeah, for for, for all, we almost and, thought that the one. And what, I thought it was, was the one product? longer. What was that product? Uh, basically, that was like Pinterest for science teachers. It was really dumb. <laughs> I like it, um, to, to give it a little bit more credit. It was. <laughs> It, it was the resource Doug wished he had when yeah. he was a science teacher. Oh yeah, I built something for myself. Which Hands isn't, which isn't I a bad way it. to start. How, I loved it. How did you find out that it was the wrong idea? Well, so here's what I was saying. To, earlier to what uh, Tim was saying about teachers are nice to a fault, because we'd get them on the phone, and they, wouldn't, they weren't just nice. They'd be like, this is so interesting. It, it, like, and especially when I would explain it, and like, I'm explaining like, my vision for, like, imagine a lesson that's all these visuals. And, and so the, the, where the rubber hits the road is when you start watching the usage. I mean, it was like they'd say it's so interesting, and then it was just like that. So we reached a point where I remember Keith said, like, I, it was heartbreaking to me. He's like, we're going to pivot. Um, again. Again. This is wrong. And I was like, no, 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 no. We just got to give it a few more weeks. And he's like, no, no, this is wrong. You remember this moment because you will know what traction feels like. Yeah. You're saying that to them, or he said that to you? No, I, I said me. that to him. I mean, because there was this, you know, it was not an argument, but there was a disagreement where he was like, I think people like this. Like, I wanted this. Look, we talked to the, think of those 10 teachers in the last two weeks we talked to. They all said, this is awesome. And, and, I, and I was, you know, I remember saying to Doug, this isn't what traction feels like. Like, you will know when we have traction, and this is not traction. By the way, this is one of the most non-intuitive things about, we talked about knowing when you have product market fit. Sometimes it's not so obvious, especially if you build an awesome product that it turns out customers didn't want to use. What happened that was interesting was we'd, we thought, because I was a science teacher, I was a science specialist, 
So we thought we were going after science specialists, and I'd explain this to them. And then it was a little disappointing that they wouldn't use it. Like, they didn't do science in the same way. In hindsight, this is obvious. Like, they don't teach science the way I was teaching it. That's, we're doing something unique with how we're explaining science. What happened was we would accidentally get an elementary school teacher in the funnel. And I remember the first couple times it happened because I was a little annoyed. Because I'd look at Keith like, uh-oh, this is a third grade teacher. This isn't the person we want to talk to. Right. And we posted on the middle school science teacher list. Why right. did you reply? Somehow we got the third grade. But we'd explain, oh, so here's all these pictures. And the third grade teacher would say, so what do you do with these pictures? And I'd say, well, let me just walk you through how I would use them. And then it was like th after three times that that happened where a teacher said, I wish I could have just recorded everything you just did and play that back for my kids that were like, huh. So, I think we solved someone's problem right now. So it wasn't exactly sort of a sophisticated product segmentation analysis that got you to figure out what product market fit was. Your users walked oh, you into it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was systematic about, all right, so this is what we know, and this is what we don't know, and okay, well, if that's not true, then what, what else could we? And so it was clear that, you know, to connect the dots a little bit, Doug had this unique way of teaching science. Um, the key ingredient being that he actually explains the evidence for how we know the conclusions. Like, funny enough, I don't know why. You know, like, you know there's a molten core in the middle of the earth, right? Like, we all learned that. Of course we know there's one. Even though no teacher ever told us how humans have figured out there's a molten core thousands of miles beneath our feet, you know, that's the disconnect in science class. So Doug teaches science class very differently. Pictures play a key role, because when you're presenting evidence, you often show the evidence for what, you, what it is you're teaching. And so this was a resource that was a collection of pictures. But middle school science teachers don't teach science that way. So they were fascinated by it, with it, but they didn't know what to do with it. And so the more Doug showed them, the more they started to look like finished lessons. And then elementary teachers got excited about finished lessons. Because so they don't have a, an opinion on how science should be taught. And they were actually, on the contrary, they were it's the subject they're the most scared of teaching. So they're like, if you could just step in and help me, that would be great. So, so walk us through it in a little more detail. What happened when you finally figured out, oh, this is our product, this is, and you know, when you had that moment when Keith looked back to you and said, see, this is traction. Yeah, yeah I mean, it was it, like, and we've saved all these screenshots because we now walk all new employees through the origin story. And so there was a, you know, a screenshot with all these thumbnails that looks like Pinterest. And then they're ordered. And then there's captions beneath them. And then there's an intro paragraph. And it's like starts to look more and more like a lesson. And then it is a finished lesson. And so there was a point where we said, okay, elementary teachers seem much more excited about this. Let's find 10 elementary teachers and 10 homeschoolers. So we actually were considering both. And get them all to agree to teach the same eight lessons in a row. And uh, it was like December 1st. And we're like, yeah, so we'll get all eight lessons done by the end of the year, and then they'll all start right after the holidays. And then we, so we had 20 people in this pilot, and this was you know, pivot number seven or so on our list. And we're pretty sure it was gonna work, just like we were pretty sure the last six were gonna work, and it worked, they, they loved it. So once a week, you know, starting January 1st of 2013, I think it was, um, once a, 14, yeah, once a week for the next eight weeks, we released the lesson and scrambled to get it done in time. And it was just a much, you know, they were incredibly enthusiastic about using it and the feedback that we got and they were sharing us anecdotes from, the, sharing with us anecdotes from the kids and it was clear it was very different. Um, a, a lot of times you really know you have product market fit and traction because it just kind of goes and happens and all of a sudden you find people using your product that you had never heard of and, and you know, your servers start to break, et cetera. How did that happen and when did you know? I mean, I remember one moment this was back when, um, now in hindsight, if you want to put something, if you find a Facebook page, I used to look for, um, it's funny, you talk about the hard thing about hard things. He, talk, he says, don't look for silver bullets. I love looking for silver bullets, though. I ignore that advice. I used to look for a silver bullet so that we could get the word out about mystery science to people. And I, I love using Facebook, so I would always look for, like, how, there's got to be some Facebook page that all the teachers are on. Um, and I wound up finding this one that had, like, over a million likes, and it was this era when if you posted it, if you had a Facebook page and you had people like your page, then they saw your post. Now, in, in hindsight- In their feed. Yeah, in their feed. In hindsight, it was the first, like Facebook was giving you a free year, like looking back on it. Now, that, now it's like, yeah, sure, you can give that to everyone if you pay Facebook a lot of money, right? But we managed to convince this guy um, to put a, a, like a little ad up about mystery science. And how many signups did we get in a day? Um, it was, we got about 15,000 signups, 10,000 so signups over, that, over so, a so week Jeff, or so. To your question, that, like, I remember being like, 
Oh, Keith, is that is this what you mean, like traction? Like <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, didn't you guys know that there were these huge um, gorillas, the McGraw Hills? I don't know, Random House, Pearson, who who sell science curriculum to these schools? Didn't you know you had no chance against them? Um, Shouldn't you have known that? I, this this was a case of you know if you want to do something impossible, give it to someone who doesn't know that it's not impossible. You know, it doesn't know yet that it's impossible. So we didn't. You know, even at this time, I, I was actually pretty ignorant of the whole curriculum company space. So I didn't know that at all. Maybe you knew that. We didn't talk about that a lot. We we thought we were building a resource for teachers, and the distinction between supplemental resources and curricular resources was totally foreign to us. And you know, one company in the space that served as a model for us was called Brain Pop, which is this you know like a website that teachers pay money for that has a bunch of subscriptions. And you know, we researched all the sort of competitors in the space, and they claim to have 20% of schools in America paying them, and they charge about $1,500 per school. And what we were making was not too dissimilar from that. And so that was one data point that we know it's possible for at least one company to pull this off. And in retrospect, they're not a curricular resource. And so we assumed we were going to be a supplemental fairly early on. Um, and so that we didn't really think about those companies. Do you remember your very first sale? No, it was kind of cheating. Like, we, like the, the one thing we both had is we know a lot of people in the space. So a friend of ours who ran a school agreed to pay us money on the side so that we could say we had a paying customer. I think that was our first thing. Did, did you decide from the very beginning that this was a for-pay service? Um, I'm trying we to remember. We charge for a when while. We, yeah, when did we decide that? I mean, the, ones, the one thing I can relate that might be of interest is I definitely remember our first um, user, like our first teacher, we like enshrine her. I've joked with her, and she she's not too weirded out by this. That we should have like a cardboard cutout of her in the office because we she I, I tell like anyone that joins our company like you have to meet Kiyomi is her name and like learn learn to think like Kiyomi. Like she is. We have a, different customers now, different mental models of like what our user is, but she is just the prototypical um, target user for us. And um, so I remember her, and then on the sales side. Well, it was a couple of years into it before we started sales, and I remember saying to ourselves, if we work really hard, this was in January, we were going to start sales, and if, if we thought, if we worked really hard, we could sell 300 schools by June, and we sold 1,500. So that was... Yeah. We, we, we knew fairly early on that we were going to charge some kind of subscription fee for, for this, you know, as we started thinking about the teacher resource. Um, but didn't know how we were going to sell to schools. I really didn't want to build a sales team. We were just focused on growing free usage. So it was a freemium model, and we treated this like a consumer business, you know, a consumer web business. Like teachers are our customers. Let's get them to spread us word of mouth, and we'll figure out the whole making money thing at some point. That's how we held it. So as you guys just heard, um, Doug just threw out a number like 1,500. They've sold to a lot of schools. Um, so you kind of have squared this circle. Everyone knows how hard it is to sell to schools, but somehow you guys have managed it. What's, c can you give a little, a little bit of the secret sauce if you're going to try to be successful selling into districts and schools what you need? I don't, you should take the piece of the automation because the thing I would say, like one piece of the sauce is um, when you were asking about Pearson earlier, right, is like, yeah, those those big behemoths, they make stuff and they sell stuff, but do teachers like it? Um, and I hate naming, like I'm fine trash talking Pearson, I feel like everyone does that. Um, but, but you know, there's, I won't, like there's other, there's in the science curriculum space, let's just say there's, if any, if any of you out there know anything about science education, there are large boxes that are, have like an inch of dust on top of them in many schools, and 10 years ago they were sold. Uh, to schools as a curriculum, and teachers don't use them. So the secret sauce for us was, well, make something teachers love, make something s that the kids love. Um, and if you do that, you solve so many problems because the teachers are willing to spread, spread this virally via word of mouth. And then even willing to be, not your salespeople, but they're willing to, when it comes time to, um, to like submit a purchase order to the principal, like they're more than happy to do that. Yeah, although that was not obvious, you know, early on. So, you know, we knew that we had something that teachers loved and that we were, you know, fundamentally creating a lot of value for teachers and for students. And so that was sort of step one 
and we had done a pretty good job of growing. I think we'd passed 100,000 signups or so, um, and so we felt pretty good about that. But it was non-obvious how to sell to schools. We hired, uh, we, you know, we asked a lot of people advice, and it was you hire a VP of sales and you build a sales team. And so we hired a VP of sales, and three months later we fired a VP of sales. <laughs> and was that the biggest thing that went wrong as you were trying to grow? Um, Probably. I mean, we the, the hardest part of the business was, um, gosh, if, was it before or after that that we almost ran out of money? I can't, I, that was after that. It was right after that? Okay, so yeah, so yeah we had, um, we, it was not obvious that we could sell, and we were almost out of money, and we, I think we got down to like 60 days of runway or something like that, and we were already started working on plan B, and we'd been trying to fundraise for three or four months, and you know, we had... The, uh, maybe we had 80,000 signups at that point and you know some amount of usage of that uh, maybe f three uh, single digit thousands of teachers using this so it was interesting but not obviously a great business and we we talked to you know our early investors none of them wanted to re-up actually <laughs> um, and we got a couple new investors who who were passionate about the vision and you know were much more interested in the change that we were trying to bring about in the world than than the, us being able to make a really clear um, economic case for it. But they were optimistic, um, and so uh, we we can we raised two million dollars then, and after that we um, hired this VP of sales and we're like, all right, so now you know we don't want to ever run into the situation again. Let's try to start trying to solve the sales problem sooner than we otherwise would have, because we still felt like we had small numbers. Um, so just a, a quick pivot in the short amount of time we have left. You talked about making something that the teachers love, and at Y Combinator, sort of our motto is making something people want, which, by the way, if you're going to default to anything as a secret for success, that's it. Um, and it's, it's great to point out that you guys are Y Combinator um, summer 2017 batch. Tell us about your thought process as a company that was actually doing, frankly, really well when you guys decided to come in and do YC. Yeah, because you just heard the bad part where you heard 60 days of runway. But when we decided to join YC, we were already profitable. Um, and it wasn't yeah, an easy decision. We turned decision. around at that we point. We turned yeah. it around, yeah. <laughs> so it was an easy decision for YC to make. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and I, we'd applied before. We had applied before. I don't know if you it know It was a hard job. decision for us to make. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, oh, no, that's true. Yeah, we got rejected early on um, back with the, tech, uh, the, the Pinterest website. Um, it was, yeah, I, I don't know that our story is that telling. Um, I mean, it, it was a very unique decision for us. It was a hard decision. There were a number of things that we were, a number of, we were fundamentally trying to sort of get the business to the next level. We thought YC could help in a number of ways. Um, I don't know. I'm, I don't have a good sense. Like it, it was a very much a pro con list approach of like, well, we could get this, we could get this, but here's the downside. I would say it summed up as we were pretty sure we were going to raise another round about then, and YC could help with that. Um, we were focused a lot on scaling the team, and we were going, we were, were planned to do a sort of PR push about that time anyway. Being part of YC would be an interesting part of that. I'd heard great things about the program from multiple friends who'd gone through it, one of them who had just finished it. And he was a really unconventional company in, in the batch, um, the, the supersonic plane um, company. And so I had a number of conversations with him about that. Blake. Yeah, Blake. Because we were unusual as well, and so we compared notes on a number of things. Um, and then... The supersonic plane of ed tech companies. <laughs> I like it. And I had lunch with you, and, and you, you were part of convincing me at least that, oh, no, it's not that weird for a company at your stage. Like, you should consider it anyway. It wasn't something I was seriously considering at that time. What... Is there any particular piece of advice you'd give to folks here who many or all of which are are hopeful to do YC as they um, think about going through the process? Do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, we're I weird. Like that advice. Why, I mean, everyone knows YC is, uh, is about, you know, the, the, the reputation is it's early stage, of course, and it's helping people find product market fit. And so definitely, I, like, we saw that. And it was funny, like for Keith, who's a se seasoned entrepreneur, um, I mean, we, he really enjoyed the talks as we did it. But for me, having never, this is my first time being an entrepreneur, like, the talks were amazing. I mean, that alone, the mentors, the network, um, the advice that we that we get. It exceeded all of my expectations. Yeah. Um, and so it was sort of lived up to the reputation. And I think at the end of the day, it's a combination of the advice, 
the clarity on on our own business um, and refining of strategy, um, all all the other founders that we met and Bookface, which is the internal social network, and then the ultimate sort of fundraising process. We we raised uh, money after on demo day too. Awesome. Uh, I'm I'm going to ask one final question for Doug. Um, Doug, you pulled yourself out of a nice, comfortable, cushy, superstar science teacher job into the role of a full-time founder. Can you talk about your thought process in doing so and what it's been like? Yeah. So I think it was interesting earlier to see how much the how many people in the room are already doing startups. Um, I don't think I have to like, I don't think there's any teachers out there where I have to nudge, yeah, okay, if there's are. If you're on the edge, talk to me, because I, I can help push you. Um, I mean, there's, there's sort of advice I can give to teachers about if you're thinking about doing this. Um, I mean, for me, it was, I was always interested in scale. Now, in hindsight, it's so naive and foolish to think that I was teaching 60 kids a year. And I was at this private school that had, was going to scale up. And I remember, now I play it back in my head, and it's like, if we work really hard in 10 years, we'll reach 100,000 kids. And you know, if you're working in tech, like you should rightly be like, yeah, like you could reach a lot more than that. Um, so I was, it was around this time that um, there was the rise of these science communicators on YouTube. And I remember, I'd, I always had this sort of mystery approach to my lessons, where we start things with a question. And this guy, Vsauce, put out a video in 2011 called Why Do You Have Two Nostrils? And it was amazing. I mean, it was, about, it was about your respiratory system. It was totally the kind of thing I would have made. And by the end of the week, he had 1.3 million views. And I said to Keith, that's the same number of people that watch ABC Monday Night Football. Like, I just, that many people want to know why you have two nostrils? And like, he's just run into this, like, accidentally. Like, I want to actually, I want to do this. Like, none of those YouTube YouTubers are, are trying to make a science curriculum or actually influence science education in the country. So. Um, it, I was a pretty easy sell, like once Keith said, take what you're doing, bring it up here, the digital revolution is happening, let's reach a huge audience. Thank you guys so much for coming back and spending time. Yeah.